the Mexican Grand Prix, in my opinion, and I'm sure in Scott's opinion, was twice as good as the American Grand Prix, which is the United States Grand Prix. It had action everywhere. And not only did it have action, but it had these mini storylines that were, in my opinion, almost better than the race. I mean, did Charles really buckle under the pressure? And that's why he had that 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 many stint and he, he almost hit the wall by this much and he he just snapped it back, which was amazing. But why did it happen? Did he crack under the pressure? And then finally, Super Max for a step in got penalties for dive bombing people. He's been doing it forever. And finally, finally, from what George says, 19. George Russell said 19 of the 20 drivers all agreed they wanted to actually instate this rule for next year. And they all said, no, we want it done right now. Haas, Mercedes, and Q and A and different quotes from the internet all coming up on the best show in the world. And what is that, Scott? Yeah, America F1. America F1. It's a golden run. America F1. Scott Ferrari with another double podium in a dominant performance by Carlos Sainz. Yes. What's your take? My take is McLaren has a lot to be worried about in the Constructors' Championship. <laughs> Ferrari is now only 29 points behind McLaren for the World Constructors' Championship with four races to go, meaning all the Scuderia need to do is, uh, is basically gain just a little over seven points a race on McLaren for the next four races. Can they do it? Well, you bet they can. Right now, the Scuderia under Fred Vasseur is performing like a championship oh, level team. So it's great. First time, in my opinion, mm -hmm. Jean Todd ran the place uh, with Russ Braun and Michael Schumacher. I got to tell you, you want Ferrari to be a championship team? You want them to bring the World Constructors Championship? I do, I do, I do, I do. Put a Frenchman in charge. <laughs> What? Yep. What do you mean put a Frenchman in charge? That's what happened. That's what happened in the John Todd era, and that's what's happening in the Fred Vasseur era. Get an outside. There is tremendous talent within Scuderia Ferrari. But to, to, to harness it, to unleash it, you need an outsider who's not from the company, mm. who's willing to fire people, because Mattia was not willing to fire people who he's been with for 30 years. The head of strategy, gone. Charles's race engineer, Zavi, who was terrible, gone. He was bad. Yeah, so was the head of strategy. You know, now nobody know, makes fun of Ferrari for laughable pit stops anymore, for laughable strategy anymore. They now have, on average, the second fastest pit stops in Formula One. You, you have a reinvigorated team that believes that it can win the World Constructors Championship with two really good drivers. Now, look, we'll see. McLaren was definitely fastest on Sunday. Lando was on the hards on the second stint. He was faster than Ferrari, and it forced Charles into a mistake because Charles was pushing as hard as he could to keep Lando behind him. And mm -hmm. frankly, even without the mistake, he would have been passed. You think so? You think he would have passed? Him oh, yeah, by then, it was like within a second, of course. Yeah. It was a matter of time. Now, let me be clear. Charles should have had more margin. But his team did slow him down a little bit uh, because they didn't want to fight, I think, between the two Ferrari drivers because the one thing about Ferrari is they didn't care if Charles or Carlos won because, really, Charles is not going to win the Drivers' Championship. Right, right. So, it doesn't so matter. All they, they didn't care who won. They wanted a 1-2. You know, and I so got a question for you. When, when you say that, yeah. did you think that, Charles' mistake 
kind of shows that he, because he's done that before when he's been pressured, he makes that mistake. And it kind of larkened me back all the way to 2019 when Vettel was ahead of Hamilton and Hamilton was pressuring him lap after lap after lap. And then he just spun off in first place. And I was like, as soon as that happened, that that's what came to my head. And I was like, is this like Charles, is he one of those guys that when he's super pressured, he like Lando, is he's, he's going to make a mistake? Or you think that he just went over one part of the track and he just caught caught no. some dirt and it was windy in that part of the track. I heard him complaining about it. What do you think? You look, he was pushing very hard because Lando was catching up. I mean, look, a really unforced era was La Castellet in 2022 when he was fighting Max for the championship when he had a bigger lead and he just screwed it up and it went into the wall. This was more of a forced era where he really, you know, he was right within the cusp of DRS range with Lando mm -hmm. behind him, and he was pushing harder than the car could do. I mean, frankly, Lando was much faster on the hards than anyone else on track, and frankly, Oscar probably was too, except that for the second race in a row, he had some horrific quality performance. He, you know, Oscar had bad quality performance, you know, started off, uh, you know, near the back of the grid. Uh, just like Wait, not talking about Oscar right now, let's talk about what Charles had to say on this Max Verstappen and Lando controversy. But basically, it's oh. him every race doing something, and everyone else is looking at it and taking advantage of it. And I, I welcome Max being as aggressive to Lando as possible because <laughs> it helps me. Uh, at least it gives me chances to be closer to Lando in the drivers' championship because it's still a, a fight. Uh, Yes. Now, before you answer that, let's make sure that everybody remembers to like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification for our channel so you can be notified when we have a new episode up. Remember, we don't do just long-form episodes. We also do shorts here at America F1. America F1, and we are on all platforms. Sorry to cut you off there, Scott. What were you saying? What do you think about what Charles had to say on this? I think Max the Scuderia's best that. friend right now uh, is Max Verstappen because Max is not racing Ferrari. He doesn't care about winning the race right now. No one will care 10 years later if Max won Mexico. But people will care and remember, was Max a four-time world champion or not? Max is racing Lando, and his job is to kill Lando's world championship bid, which he's doing. Which he's doing. And so let me tell you, when Max pushed Lando off the track for the second time mm -hmm. at turn eight, when, when he went way off the track, and yeah. then Lando, who was trying to pass him again, you know, got pushed off the track even more. Yeah. That slowed the two of them down. And Charles, you know, rocketed from P4 to P2. Uh, you know, Max is Max is doing great work for the Scuderia. And let me tell you. People in Marinello are probably making pizzas and pastas in Max's honor right now. <laughs> <laughs> because if this form keeps up with both Ferraris keeping scoring on the podium, they could possibly pass McLaren and be the Constructors' champion. And who would have saw that coming uh, five races ago? Well, you know what? It's only 29 points. They only need seven, slightly over seven points a race. What's, what's, what's going on is two things. Number one, the Monza upgrade worked. Mm -hmm. Number one. And the flexi wing that they, front wing that they apparently brought, Toda, worked, uh, which they're allowed to do because the FIA says somewhat flexi front wings are fine. So now everyone's got it. Right. Number, one. Number two, Oscar has had two mediocre races. Uh, three, if you count the sprint race. He's not been great. He finished out of the points, I believe, in the sprint race at Coda after mm -hmm. bidding, you know, after you know having another track limits violation in SQ1 in the sprint race in Coda. So he did no points in Austin for the sprint race, finished P5 in the main race when there was a Ferrari 1-2. And now in this race in uh in Mexico City, you know, Piastri only finishes P8. So he only gets four points. So essentially, we've got the last two races, we really have Lando almost being like a Max and a Checo. Right now, Lando, last the race, has been fighting a one-man a one battle against two highly motivated cars. Now, do you think 
is this McLaren's fault? Because in this race in the Mexican Grand Prix, in Q1, he they, discon, they discounted one of uh, Piastri's laps because he had went over track limits, but they didn't have enough time to do another lap. I thought he did another lap, but his tires were too hot, actually. I think the problem was, I think he did another push lap. I think his, his tires were overheated. But or since Q1 is hard. the longest... Longest out of all the qualifying. This is longer than Q2. It's longer than Q3. Yeah. Yep. Shouldn't he have gone out a little sooner so he could at least, if you go off track, then you can do another lap so you can at least get the time? Because to get out of Q1 for McLaren is no big deal, right? You know, look, I, I put it on Oscar in terms of that, you know, when he needed to perform, he just couldn't keep it within the track limits. And the best drivers keep it within the track limits and get those times. I mean, it was totally on him. I don't blame McLaren. He had, he had laps to get it done. He didn't get it done. Uh, and unfortunately he did the same thing in SQ one in Austin. He had a tracks limits problem. And it's, yeah. it's something that it, he was amazing in the European leg where you know, it was basically, you know, that's where you train in the junior formulas. On the right. European tracks. Yeah. And we're right. familiar with those. He's got those tracks down pat. But the same thing happened to him last year where his performance slipped after Europe. And his performance this year is slipping at the very time when McLaren needs him the most. Needs him the most, yeah. Uh, two ex you know, more experienced drivers at Ferrari who are hungry and a team who is desperately hungry in Maranello to get those championships back. So I can tell you because I was their guest and I, I speak to people at Scuderia Ferrari every day. They are super motivated. They are super hungry, and they want those championships in Maranello badly. What did you hear? They think they can win. Did you hear uh, what Lando had to finally say about his bestie? His bestie. I was ahead the whole way through the corner. This guy is dangerous. I just have to avoid a crash. It's the same as last time, mate. Yeah, we're on it, mate. We I'll end up in a wall in a minute. So finally, this is the Lando. Calrissian Norris, who was complaining and winging and whining about Lewis in 2021, saying, oh, it's just racing. What are you complaining about? It's no big deal. You know, you should just learn to do, do this, do that, blah, 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 blah. And then now, when he is, he's not really in the heat of a battle like Lewis was, but when he is the challenger and Max is doing it to him, now, all of a sudden, Max is dangerous. Like, what is this guy doing? Like, doesn't he know how to race? Wheel, wheel, blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> Lewis is, well, guess what? Guess what? I bet you he has Lewis on speed dial right now. <laughs> I'm <miserating. laughs> Lewis, my brother, I know I've been sort of mean to you and rude to you trying to gain some brownie points on Max, but you were right the whole time. Now, what do I do? Uh, yeah, what I need you. Help me. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. You know, I mean, look, Lando's had to eat a lot of crow lately. He also made that disgusting comment about how, you know, hey, Lewis, you know, whatever. You just had the fast, you know, you just had the fastest car, blah, blah, blah. Anyone can win in a fast car. Guess what? B.A. That's, that's crap. Yeah, it's only obviously Only a crap, champion cause... driver puts a championship together with the fastest car. You want to be a champion? You want to be an F1 champion? You got to have one of the fastest cars. And you have to be a champion driver because only those drivers put it together week after week after week after week with champion performances, maximizing the performance envelope of that car. So what's going on now? Lando's getting the same kind of, you know, hard racing treatment that Lewis got. Look, Max is a champion. And I don't blame Max one bit for trying to push Lando off the track because you know what? He's in a slow car. And the FIA wasn't penalizing him. So why not exploit the gray area? If it ain't a penalty, if, if the referee is not blowing the whistle, it's not a penalty. Now I agree with that. I, I, tell, I tell my kids in basketball, I tell them all the time, hey, he's not calling fouls when you reach in. Then you guys do the same thing that they're doing to you and make them, make them call it both ways. If they don't call it, then we, we're going to take advantage of the same thing. You know, and when you're doing baseball, hey, if he's not calling high strikes, hey, don't swing then. He's not calling high strikes. You have to see what the rules are and see what the people who do the officiating do. And if they're not doing it, then you as a driver are a foolish for not taking advantage of it. Now, I want to be clear about something. I agree with penalties because I do think Matt broke the rules. He cannot essentially go into a corner 
release the brakes so that you can't make the corner, and then you 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 are not going to make the corner, and then you push the other guy off the track too. That's what Max has done for years, but he's gotten away with it. So why not do it? But the reality is, it doesn't comport with the rules, and people got sick of it. And eventually, too much pressure mounted, I think, on the stewards um, and the FI, and that's what happened. Um, and I mean, they say here it is. Right here, forcing another driver off the track, Max Verstappen, and the penalty is standard penalty in this case. Yes. Uh, the one thing that people are saying <laughs> that well, how come Blando only got five seconds? And there's this big British bias. They're talking about how the British drivers don't get the same penalties as the other drivers. And then to me, I, I would say that's BS because look at all the times that Max has done something and not been penalized. So obviously he is not British, but he hasn't been getting all these penalties. And, and, and this brings us to when we talk about Red Bull, one of the things I like about one Christian Horner, and here he is with the telemetry and all the phones, if you saw this before, and he was talking about how, well, Max really was ahead and look at the telemetry and blah, blah. This guy will mm -hmm. go to the ends of the earth for his driver and if he was in charge of mercedes doing ad 2021 they would have went to court they would have fought tooth and nail for their drivers and no matter what you have to say about christian horner i love that about this man he will back his people and he will bring out the most craziest things you've ever ever saw just to Prove his point that his driver didn't make a mistake, and none of these other drivers, none of these other principles do what Christian yeah. does. No, look, and and I think the I think the penalty call on the fur, on the turn four instance, the first one was closer, and it could have been that Lando might not have made the corner. I'm not sure. The second one was this was disgusting. That was absolutely blatant. Max was you mean no, that? Yeah. Max was that. nowhere near the corner. I mean, like this, nowhere near it. Look at this, this. 2021 Max versus Lewis all over again. 100. percent I mean, look. I, 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 I got total respect for Max, but, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, whatever you want to say, but this one was played. And they, if, if they didn't call a penalty on, on this one, then something was really wrong. And they I, did. <laughs> it, was, it, 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 it totally was uh, Brazil last year. I mean, yeah. Brazil 2021 when he pushed Lewis way off. But he's done this so many times. And look – I mean, when you look at this picture, and we just had it up, it's, I mean, look how far the guy is off track. I mean, he's not making that corner no matter what. And when you watch it in real time, he doesn't even turn the damn wheel. He just goes straight. And it's the same thing he did in uh, the last race. Well, what he did is he let off the brakes way early, no intention to making the corner. And the funny part is he wasn't penalized for turn eight. He was penalized. The two penalty points came at turn four, which actually sort of surprised me because when you look at the two incidents, and I actually agree with the F1 TV commentators, the turn eight incident to me is much more egregious than turn four, which I thought was much closer. Mm -hmm. And it's the one, you know, Christian talked about the telemetry. <laughs> I'm sure Christian was pulling out the telemetry for turn four, not turn eight, because there is, turn eight is, is totally indefensible. <laughs> turn four is close. He pulled uh, it out, but then there, there's these other commentators, and I don't know if you've seen – this one, there's one talking about, let me see if I can find it and pull it up, where they're talking about how all of uh, Max's championships have a, like, dark cloud over them. Like, it's some type of, either they're, there's 80, 20, 21, then there's the cost cap, then there's the brake duck issue, now there's this... Uh, this other issue that they just had uh, last week, it's always something with Red Bull while other people's championships is they have the best car or one of the best cars and they just beat the hell out of everybody. What do you have to say to that? Yeah, I, I think that's sort of nonsense. I mean, you could say Lewis's first championship was, you know, tainted by what happened with Crashgate. And I, I got to tell you, with, yeah, I, I do think the first championship, Abu Dhabi, was a robbery. I don't blame Max. I blame Michael Massey. You know, Max put himself through great driving in a position to win. Uh, but what Michael Massey did was virtually criminal. 
Right. And I never want to see him again doing anything in F1, sweeping the trash. No, no. But 2023, uh, or, or the cost cap 2022, the reality is, yeah, they were over. Whether they were over by 200000 or 500000 or a million, that's not why they won. They won because of a genius named Adrian Newey, mm. who is the only senior designer in all of F1, excuse me, who uh, had a PhD in ground effect and had his dissertation yeah, in ground so effect aerodynamics in F1. The only senior designer in Formula One who was around at the last ground effects era decades ago designing the same ground effects cars. His knowledge isn't worth 500000 His knowledge isn't worth a million. According to Aston Martin, it's worth more than $100 million. And you wow. know what? They're right. They're, they're right. Man, we'll see. Max Verstappen is going to be a three, a four-time world champion, certainly the last three in the ground effects, because of Adrian Newey's you know, car getting him in a position to win. And right. he's a great driver. So to me, you know, look, I'm not a Max hater. I respect a good driver. Um, I don't view the cost cap as significant. I view 2023 whatever the break duct issue is, as first of all, no one proved it ever happened, but the car was so dominant, it's more than just a break duct. They just blew everyone away with the, A, the development of the car, and B, Max's driving was absolutely impeccable. It is the greatest season, I think, in F1 history, in history of F1 for any single driver, anybody, better than Senna, uh, better than Lewis, better than any, that season, Better than any season. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And, you know, like I said, as as for this season, yeah, he's driving hard. He's trying to win. He did get penalized for this race. But again, I I just think it's 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 more the fact that his opponents, his main opponent, Lando, is not a championship level driver. If you put Lewis in that car, in that McLaren, if you put Fernando in that car, if you put Max Verstappen in that car. They would have kicked the crap out of Max Verstappen in the RB20. But they have a, a so-so driver, a fast driver who doesn't quite yet have the championship-level quality to fight a Max. And that's it right there. And I don't know why all Sorry. these people out there in F1 internet world, and they all act like Lando's there. He's not there yet. And the reason why, all you have to do is look at how he handles this first lap. He's always on pole. Well, a lot of times this year he's on pole. But he can't even get, stay in first place after the first turn. He can't even do it. And and it takes, everyone thinks, oh, well, you have the fastest car. You should make the racecraft. He has. Uh, you know what? I'll give you a case in point. I think Carlos, he has good race craft, but I think he's not aggressive enough. I'll give you a perfect case. Carlos Sainz, okay, on lap nine or ten, right? Passes, repasses Max after Max takes the lead from him. How does he do it? He's on the main straight. He waits till the last possible moment. And then he cut, he breaks very late. And when Max isn't expecting it, dives on the inside. Max never sees it coming. Passes him, gets in the lead. Carlos Sainz, better racecraft than Lando Norris? Yes, with the overtaking that time. Okay, Lando, that's how you pass Max. Lando Norris, what does he do when he generally tries to pass Max? He often waits, 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 kills his tires. By the time he passes them, they're not as strong as it was. And then he tries to go around the outside. No, Carlos passed him the first opportunity that he had on the inside. Max never started coming. Max knows Lando's going to be reticent. He's going to wait. He's Probably going to pass him on the in on the outside. Lando Norris better racecraft than Lando Norris. Yes. Yeah. Did you see the first part of 2022 when Max and Le- and and uh, and uh, Car- Charles had basically equivalent cars? Those first number of races when they were close, when the RB18 was still overweight. Okay. Remember the racing at Bahrain and Saudi Arabia when they were just constantly exchanging the lead, they were having these incredible wheel-to-wheel battles with no contact, uh, no touching, no driving each other off the track because the difference is Max respects Charles because Charles used to remember the, the just an incident, uh, incident issue between the two of them when Charles shoved Max off the track. Max respects Charles' racecraft and doesn't respect Landers. That's key. That's a good point. You know, Scott, you, you, your memory, that, that must be that lawyer. Your memory is very sharp. 
Now, we're going to, before we start talking with the family of Red Bull, you know, what happened at RB, because oh, all that happened at RB. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get to that, we're going to do a new segment that we are introducing today at America F1, which is quotes from the internet. And so we're going to take random quotes, well, not really random, ones that we like and that are very poignant for the race that we're reviewing or that we're previewing. So in this case, these are some of the quotes from the Mexican Grand Prix. This one's about Max Verstappen and Red Bull. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And Red Bull and the Verstappen family are a living example of that because how on earth are you complaining about legitimate penalties? Here's another one on Max, and I think this one comes from Max and also um, Fernando Alonso talking about British bias. Max (laughs) Max Verstappen's attempt to obtain a British passport, which he believes will afford him favorable treatment, are set to fail because the British government will not approve a passport for anyone with acts of terrorism on their record. <laughs> I like that one. Wow. <laughs> that one's great. I love that one. That's not nice. <laughs> yeah, I, lo- I really like that one. And this one is from uh, Sir Lewis Hamilton. That is not Simply Lovely. And they're asking, oh, I think I have Simply Lovely. So this one's from uh, Lewis Hamilton when they asked him about the Lando Max accident. And at that time, he didn't actually see it. Like he didn't, you know, he didn't see the review of it. But this is what he had to say. I have not seen it. I could see a group of cars ahead and I saw a plum of smoke like dust. And I knew right then and there laughing who was involved. (laughs) I remember that one. (laughs) Oh, And and our last one, this one comes from Josh Verstappen. He says the FIA should take a good look at the steward staff, who they put there, and whether there is any appearance of a conflict of interest. For example, former drivers who have more sympathy for certain drivers than other drivers. Now that... Johnny Herbert? Yeah. That that actually... I I don't agree with Josh Verstappen pretty much. I probably say 85% of the time, but on this case, he makes a very salient point and there should be one permanent stewards Two, they should have no affiliation with any F1 team on the grid prior or future or at the time. Word, word, brother. Yep. I mean, in particular, if you go to Austin where, um, you know, Max came out on top. He wasn't penalized. Lando was, you know, one of the stewards there was apparently a Honda dealer, the same company that puts the power unit in the back of whose car? Now, when you go to Mexico, apparently one of the stewards, you know, from what I've read, one of the stewards uh, has ties to the power unit to McLaren. Um, and Max gets a big penalty there. 20, 20 seconds drops him all the way down to six. So what are we doing here, guys? And you have Johnny, you know, Herbert who doesn't like, who seems not to like Max, who seems to penalize him when he can or talk bad about him on the air. But you know what? What are we doing, guys? Mm-hmm. This is the world's greatest motorsport. Why are we using rent stores? Yes. Why are we using yes. Why are we doing it? Why don't we have well-paid stewards, well-paid, no ties to any team. You are not allowed to have any ties to any team or to any driver or to any sponsor. You're well-paid, you're professional, you do it the whole year round. And you can't then for a period of time after you somehow roll off being a steward, be hired by any team. That, that's the way it should work, like five years or something like that. That's, yeah. the, way it should work. that's the way it should be. Make it professional. Um, you know, having these stores with ties to teams and sponsors, 
That's like the fox garden the hen house. Come on, guys. What are we doing here? It's a bunch of malarkey, as the president would say. You just should it shouldn't happen. And it's not befitting of the world's top motorsport. Very well said. Very well said. Now, here is one sister team, Mr. Liam Lawson, who had a lot of problems this weekend. One, he flipped Checo off. And Checo says it was because of what I heard you say something in our <coughs> prep that I didn't hear. Yeah, Liam Lawson flipped Checo in Mexico on national international TV, the famous son of Mexico flipped him the bird in the middle of the main straight, um, which probably means Liam Lawson needed security and perhaps a disguise to get out of Mexico alive and unscathed. Because what, what I heard and read uh, was that Checo was brake testing him ex extensively and blocking him for laps. And I, I have seen Liam on a number of occasions. I've interacted with him. And he's never really struck me as a total jerk, a total hothead. He seems pretty chill. For him to get that riled up, something probably I, – so, I didn't have time to look at his, you know, all of his camera before I came on. But personality-wise, Liam is not a total jerk. And I can't imagine him doing that unless something bad happened. But then again, does want to see – you probably hate the person who's blocking you a little bit from your lifelong dream. And, you know, remember – George Russell versus Valtteri Bottas in 2021. Yes, yes. Up, they crash. What does George do after, after a 300 kph crash? Not sees how he was. He runs over to Valtteri and slaps him on the helmet. The helmet. And yeah, calls him I remember that. Yeah. And so guess what? We now have Mercedes becoming Red Bull and Red Bull becoming Mercedes. See, we're all separated by a little circle. Here is one Liam Lawson waiting for Christian Horner to, I guess, scold him or interview him or talk to him about discipline. And this goes to Zach Brown talking about how these two teams should not be tied at the hip. And I agree 100% with Mr. Zach Brown. And he just and that goes on and that he stands there for like another two minutes and Liam's just sitting there standing there waiting for Daddy to come in and, and slap his hand. That's What's your take on that? That's not an accident. Christian is <coughs> way too smart. He was sending him a message and letting him cool his heels. And look at the end, Liam ended up apologizing for giving Checo the finger. Um. And I guarantee you that was not done out of the goodness of his heart. It was not done spontaneously. It was done because he was told, you better do that because it's bad look for Red Bull. Now, here's another thing. And it's kind of Checo. No, check. I don't know if you've seen this or read this. Checo says that Liam, he in this meeting that they had, because I guess Checo was there and Max was there and you know, uh, Helmet Marco was there and, you know, the whole Redbud family was there to like basically say, this is how we act and this is how it goes here. He said that Liam needs to have a little bit more respect and be a little bit humble because how he interacted also with Fernando Alonso earlier, as you know, they had that big uh, back and forth. And he says, hey, you're going to disrespect a two time world champion and not actually listen to what he has to say to you and act like you know it all. Like you need to be a little bit humble because as fa fast as you come here in F1 is as fast as you can be gone in F1 if people don't like you and you don't respect the tradition and everything that goes on here. And to, to be honest, like how we would say it is cool your jets, bro. You know, <laughs> like cool your jets. You're like you're coming in too hot. Like you don't come in here hot. You come in here Learn, listen, keep your ears and eyes open and your mouth shut is what usually you tell new people. Right. And I'm pretty sure you tell them that at your job when they first come in. Like, we don't want to hear all all that noise. You got to say, learn the business first and then then you can get your two cents in. But until you learn, I don't want to hear from you. Go learn first. 
the advice isn't bad. Checo is not the best source of it right now, given that he is bottling it. I mean, he started in P18, finished P17, went out in Q1 in his home race. He's literally cost, he has cost Red Bull not only P1, but P2 in the Constructors' Championship. I mean, he's not performing anymore. He's kind of washed. I mean, it's sad to say, because he is, I've, I'm every race I see him that I'm in the paddock, I, I interact with him. He's a nice, Very nice, guy. nice guy. You hate to say that, but you know there comes a time in every driver's career when it's time to hang it up, um, and his time has come. It's time. Who's who was more washed, Daniel Ricciardo or Sergio Checo Perez? Would we have would would Daniel have done better in this seat than Sergio would? And the only reason I ask that is because Yuki in the RB has out-qualified him like I think nine times this year and he's in the sister car who's not as fast with not as much downforce yep. and he's waxing Checo in qualifying a lot of people in back market cars are waxing Checo in qualifying he's not the only one Checo's just done hard look I think Ricardo is operating at a fairly similar level to Checo or was or maybe a little better I don't think the Daniel Ricardo of this year, unfortunately, is the brilliant Daniel Ricciardo we saw at the peak of his career with the late breaking. We, we have we've not sat seen that kind of brilliance, unfortunately, um, in a back marker car um, or in a so so car either. I, I think it was time for both. So I think it was time for Ricardo and it's time for Checo to move on. Mm -hmm. Let's get some younger drivers um, and see what they can do. I mean, if it wasn't for Sergeant leaving, we would never have had a young sensation like Franco Colapinto ever get a chance in F1. Nobody thought he was going to be good. He's pretty darn good. He doesn't finish lower than P12 um, in a not great car. And he keeps beating Alex Albon every single race lately. Every single race. And that, that brings us to the crash with my guy, Yuki. <laughs> what? Oh, Yuki, what are you doing, Yuki? Yuki, Yuki, Yuki. Again, Yuki doesn't finish a race in Mexico, and he's never finished a race in Mexico. But was it his fault, or was it Alex Albon's fault? It was nobody's fault. I agree with the stewards. It was a racing incident. I mean, he followed the edict of Senna, you know, if, if you're not going for a gap, you're no longer yeah. driver. There was a gap. Um, the reason for the crash is Pierre Gasly moved over, which wasn't his fault either, by the way. But Albon got sandwiched. He had nowhere to go. That's what caused the crash. It was nobody's fault. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a racing incident. Yuki did take a chance. Look, Alapinto took a chance, okay, in Singapore. He did mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. The same thing. And just by a little bit of luck and in happenstance, you could, it could be a brilliant triple, quadruple overtake, or you can end up in the wall. And you know, the, the thing I'm sad about as – a Yuki fan. <laughs> you, yeah, we all know that. He's. We've had this. It's Liam Lawson and Yuki, and we're going to have six races and see who comes up on top. And on two races so far, Yuki hasn't even finished a race. And I'm hoping it's not due to pressure. I'm just hoping it's just to, you know, bad luck. You know, hey, he went through the gap. The guy moved over and he's out of the race. And, you know, I don't but, think it matters. I don't think Yuki has ever been considered for, I think, temperamental reasons. I think I think Red Bull judges him for one reason or another, whether it's his temperament or whatever, as not fit for that seat. And I don't think no matter what he does, they will ever give him that seat. This is what I would do. I'm in charge of Red Bull right now. I, because Carlos Sainz has it in his contract with Williams, that he can leave Williams for one of the top teams. He can leave for Mercedes. He can leave again for Ferrari. He can leave for McLaren. And he can leave for Red Bull. Now, I would say if I was Carlos Sainz's manager, which, you know, I think is his, is his brother or uncle or something. Like his that. uncle. Yeah. I would go and tell him I want that Red Bull seat because we all know they're getting rid of Checo. Yeah, and yeah. instead of bringing uh, Liam Lawson or Yuki or Daniel Ricciardo back. They're not bringing Ricciardo back. Ever. So I would say who better than me? Three-time winner this year. One of the hottest properties going, other than Carlo Pinto, I would say. Bring if me had, into that Red Bull seat. If Red Bull has a brain, 
they would have put Carlos Sainz in that seat already. And Christian, if you're listening, or if anyone from Red Bull is listening, if you have a brain, you will bring Carlos Sainz into the team. Stop, stop letting your insecurity rule you. Okay. And that's totally 100% insecurity. Max may be leaving in a few years. He keeps saying that he doesn't want to race forever. And you keep hearing flirtations with Aston Martin, with Mercedes. He may leave. You can't let him dictate the number one driver unless it's in his contract. Because there's all sorts of rumors the only reason Carlos Sainz didn't get that seat is yells for staff and vetoed it because he hates his father. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. But I got to tell you, Red Bull is hurting itself by not putting Carlos Sainz in that seat. Look at what Carlos has done at Ferrari. Two wins this year, frequently on the podium. He's he's excellent, excellent driver. I mean, do is he Lewis Hamilton or Max? No, but he's right at the next level down, always scoring points, always on the podium when he can get so t- totally capable of winning a race. Terrific strategist, good teammate. He's always popular with his teams. You got it. This is the guy to put in the seat right now. This is the guy you have to. But they're not going to. <laughs> They should. It's they just won't. good business. And and know why it makes so much sense? Because you take Carlos from Williams, you put him in the Red Bull, and then now we open that seat up to our guy, Franco Colavento. And it's he's already there. It's a win-win for the fans. It's a win-win for the teams. It's a win-win for Formula One. And that is what they should do. Now, who's the Williams? <laughs> Now, moving on to the great battle that was Lewis Hamilton and George Russell for lap after lap after lap after lap. It was very respectful. They left room for each other while they were racing. There was no time where I thought that they were going to crash. And even on the radio, they said, hey, you guys are racing. Keep it respectful. And they didn't probably have to say that. They I mean, Lewis is pretty respectful when he drives his teammate, unless it's, you know, Rossberg. But (laughs) (laughs) having said that, that is what racing looks like, ladies and gentlemen. It's not that first couple laps with Max Verstappen, because that is not racing. Racing is what Lewis and George showed you lap after lap. And what a treat it was. Yeah, I mean, Mercedes was in its own race, the two of them. They were sort of not fast enough to catch the front, too fast to be caught by the back. So they literally were in their own race, the whole race. Um, and the two of them, you know, look, Mercedes, you know, Lewis and Russell and, and George are both excellent drivers. They are very strong drivers. And um, when George isn't crashing, he's actually pretty darn good. <laughs> um, his, oh, his crashing too much is a problem, but when he's not crashing – He's pretty darn good, and he's very fast, and he does know how to race, and he does know how to do wheel-to-wheel combat uh, without crashing people out. And you've, I, you've seen that over the years. He's actually a very good wheel-to-wheel racer, and so is Lewis. And they showed you, they put on a clinic, this is how you race mm. without pushing people off the track. It, it literally was a textbook clinic of how you do it. It's the same way Fernando does it. It's things like varying your line, your breaking point jinking, doing things like that without just shoving people off the track. And it was beautiful to watch. Uh, I knew eventually Lewis would win because uh, you know, not only is he a good, good driver, but George had front wing damage. Half of his front wing was falling apart. So he, he had a little bit of a lack of front down force. So eventually the conclusion was sort of foregone. Eventually Lewis was going to have to get past him because he was operating with a better car, just as um, Lando Norris was eventually going to get past uh, Charles Leclerc, no matter what happened, because he, he had a better car. I, when you say that, it almost makes me think that if they knew he had wing damage, why didn't they let Lewis ahead of him sooner? Because for the off chance of catching up to the pack, maybe they had a bad pit stop, Maybe something happened ahead of them where they had to slow down. Maybe there was a yellow. So it, that's what I think. That's the first thing I think when you, I hear you say he had wing damage. So if they knew that, they should have let Lewis ahead and let I him go on it. Hmm? I have a reason why. Okay, let's hear it. I think the theory you, you discussed at our last show is probably correct. Is, is what? George is the surviving driver. Lewis is leaving for... Scuderia Ferrari. 
uh, the team would prefer to have George beat Lewis this year. There's only so much they can do, but they, but you know, they wanted to have them settle it on track. They didn't want to implement team orders. George would have been pissed. Uh, frankly, he would have been angry. And they don't want to anger the driver who's surviving. You know, whereas Lewis is leaving. You know the Next, crazy thing about okay. this whole thing, and I said it earlier this season that when Lewis had the big lead, I said somehow, some way, they're going to find a way so George can go ahead of Lewis at the end of the season. And you could obviously see it at the Circuit of Americas. They tried to do something here because Lewis was saying, my car was so different from Q3 to the race or Q2 to Q3. He's like, there's always something going on. It's always a little bit different. And he's like, I know what it is. And he said it all the way back at Monaco when he says, no matter what I do, George is going to be up two tenths. And that was a little clue that to he's always been giving little nuggets of something's going on there. And he doesn't really want to come out and say it, but he's giving us all the little cheese and it's leading toward that they're, you know, they're taking off a little wing or the, the tires are cold or the tires not warm. There's always something. There's always something. You know, yes. I mean, he, he said in this race in Mexico, his car felt totally different in quality than it did during the practices, especially F2. I can tell you one team that will never do that to him, Scuderia Ferrari, because at Ferrari, the team always comes before the individual interests of the drivers. That is the way that they behave. And, and that's so great. You have, to, you have to subscribe to that. Mm. That's why Adrian knew he didn't get the job. Because? Because he wanted too much power for himself. It, it wasn't the money. It's that he wanted control over the technical partnerships. He wanted control over the hiring and firing of all the technical staff. And those are powers that the team, the team principal has. And they said no. And I think when he goes to Ferrari, you know, there are good points and there are bad points. They're not going to do that to his car or, or on the strategy calls. But he's probably going to have to do a little conformance things that he didn't have to do in Mercedes. So it's a two-edged sword. It's a two-way street. Now, going to our last segment and talking about the double points once again from Haas. What if Gene had made this change to Komatsu sooner and Gunther was out and Gunther's really overrated? Is Komatsu proving that Gunther's style of leadership was the wrong way for at least Haas? And are there other team principles out there that probably should be changed to somebody else? Because look at the job this man is doing in his first year. It's incredible. He's, well, he's my guy of the year when it comes yeah. to uh, principles. I mean, Haas has literally rocketed, rocketed from P10 in constructors, a joke, to P6. And they're not just in P6. They're in a strong P6. They are now 10 points ahead. A V carb, and does anyone here expect V carb is going to regain those points nope. with Eco and and K Mag firing on all cylinders, getting double points almost every race and crushing? No, no. Um, K Mag looked awesome this race. Like for once, he wasn't in any trouble. He wasn't trying to push anybody off the track. He didn't have to block for Nico. He was in his own. He element. He actually qualified higher than Nico, which was very surprising to me. And Nico didn't catch up to him on the track. He was always in his own. And this was probably the best I've seen K-Mag in quite a while. He looked fantastic. This is a perfect advertisement for K-Mag in IndyCar. Because there are going to be a lot of IndyCar teams that are going to want him. Because you think so? Is, yeah, yeah, totally. K-Mag is a very good driver. I mean, you know, he, he may have not done great this year in F1 overall. If you look at the season, let's not have too much recency bias as compared to Nico, but the reality is he's still a really, really solid driver. And if you can survive this many years in F1 and not be a total embarrassment, which he hasn't been, you are one of the best drivers in the world. F1 Isn't era. it strange how in the beginning of the year, kind of we were all saying maybe K-Mag should leave and let somebody else, whoever's coming in next year, come in because he was in so many – he had so many penalties. He had so many crashes. He was in all these controversies with Lewis and other drivers. Like, dude, like he was in, he was like a a, a running chicane. He was in everybody's way. Yep. And then all of a sudden we get to this back half of the season. We don't see any of those problems. 
we see K Mag at his best behavior in racing, probably the best right now of his career. He's free. He's you know he has no pressure. I think part of it is he's free. He has no pressure. He knows his career is over in F1. He's racing for fun now. And when he's racing for fun and the pressure's off, you see how much better he is. And the car and the car is performing the best it's ever performed since Haas won with the P5 or P6 in constructors um, in years. Um, look, as far as leadership goes, yeah, leadership matters. Look at how Fred Vassour has turned around this team. Mm -hmm. Yes, leadership matters. Gunther Steiner, you know, great on TV, you know, fun to talk to in the paddock. I love the guy personally, but look at what Kamatsu has done. There's no, there's no media circus. There's none of that. He's an engineer and he's focused on one thing on track performance. And when you perform on track, the money and the sponsors come. Look who demanded to come onto their car with immediate effect. Toyota, Toyota and racing mm -hmm. on the car. It's been on the car for two weeks. Who knows what they're doing behind the scenes? This is the team that has dominated the World Endurance Championship for years and years and years. They know how to race. And you see the effects of what Kamaso has done. The tire degradation issue that destroyed this team for yes. years. Gone. 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 And still qualifying well. But now it was always the what the back tires would, would burn up really fast, and they could just never get those back tires in the window for a long enough period of time. And they would do well. Like I remember that one race. I don't know if was it K Mag or was it Hulkenberg, and they did they had the alternative strategy, and they were in the points for a long time. And then as soon as they changed their tires, they were freaking done. And I was like, man, they can't get this. They've been running with this uh, back tire issue for two. That years. was their every race. Every was race every for two years, and they then Matsu comes in, gone. There would Probably be no gone. upgrades the whole year. They'd have one upgrade package the whole year. Now they're upgrading the car like every weekend almost. It's a different team. It's a team that's really focused on engineering and performance and not the show. And that's what they needed. And now Gene Haas is at more races with Haas than he's ever been in his entire ownership. Gene Haas is energized now as an owner and is pouring money into the team in a way that he never did before because he sees the team succeeding. And let me tell you, Lucky for Aston Martin that this that that we're now four races to go because if we had eight races to go, they would overtake Aston Martin. Yeah, because Aston yeah. Martin looks like dog crap right now. I mean, I love Aston Martin. They I love cool. the team, but they need Adrian Newey. I mean, Dan Fallows, bless his heart, is not getting it done. The car development is a joke. It's a That's killing the team. The it's, mechanics are great. The garage is great. People are great. The drivers, you know, you know. Fernando's great. The car development is lost. Think about that in the beginning of last season, the first half of last season, Fernando was in the top three every race. Yeah, he seven, was going seven seven every race. And yeah. then all of a sudden this year, that car is, it's, it's disappointing would be a nice thing to say. Look, Fernando had eight podiums last year and the downfall happened when they started upgrading the car last year. That's what happened. When Once they started upgrading the car, it was over. Um, now, yep. let's, since we, we had time to talk about Haas, we mm. might as well talk about probably the worst, and, and, they, and they never get any airtime from any of the channels. Oh, so we might as well talk about Sauber. And it's yep. just, I've never seen, it brings me back to, like Marusha and the teams where you know they were never going to be out of last place. Like, never. You were like, oh, why are they even on the grid? It's just they're just a waste of time. And mm -hmm. now Sauber is that team, and it's so disappointing. Like, they never get any better. Well, they're not going to get any better next year because apparently, the, you know, they've said and they've been quote, they're not changing their chassis next year. What? They're not changing their chassis next year in 2025. They're putting all the effort to 2026. So they are going to be next year what Haas was in 2021. That is in 2021, Haas didn't do anything to its car to get ready for 2022. So next year, Salver or Stake F1 team, Kick, Stake, whatever it's called, because they don't, doesn't really matter anymore. They're going to be Audi. 
this year. They're going to be in last place next year too. So you know what? Why not get rid of Altry and let a junior driver at least get some F1 experience? Gabriel Bortoletto or seems to be the favorite, not Paulo Pinto for that seat. Put in a new driver. You might as well because the car is going to be in last place. It's, it's a total waste of Valtteri's talent. Might as well get some new driver experience. Where does Valtteri go then? Is Valtteri going to any I car? Or go to Mercedes as reserve. That seems to be the rumor on the grid. He's going to go to reserve for Mercedes? That seems to be what, what, what he said he would consider it. Do it for a year and then hopefully get a seat somewhere else? I, I don't know. You know what the sad part is? If they had a good car, he'd probably be scoring points. I'm sure he'd be scoring points. Yeah. Yeah, he would because he he actually makes it out of Q Q one in that that dog, which is he amazing, does. which is he amazing. Does. And I, I hate I hate for guys that I really like to end up in these teams at the end of their career where they, you know they have no hope of scoring a point. No. It's so sad. They love F one so much. They want to stay in F one yeah. so much, and they rather stay in the back than go to like any car and be in the front or go to Hypercar or WC or any of the other series and be in the front, they'd rather stay in the back in F1. Yep. And that just shows you how powerful and how great the great sport of Formula One is. And before we end, we just all would like to remind everyone to like, subscribe, and to hit the notification button on our channel. We also would like to for you to watch out for our new partnership coming up next show. I don't really want to tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be rich, but I can't really say yet. And it will give you a great discount on all the great products that they have. We also like to thank everyone for tuning in and for giving us responses on Instagram, on Twitter, or X, I'm sorry, on X, and all of the other platforms that we are on. So just remember, everybody, to always keep on racing, everybody.